Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Friday, June the 4th, 2021. It is currently 1.57 p.m. Central Time. And once again, I'm coming to you live from the Sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church, located right here in Ovalo, Texas. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to listen. If you are listening live, you're always invited to participate in the chat using the Spreaker app. Just hit the little chat icon. You can ask questions. You can offer comments. You can offer your perspective. You can offer agreement. You can offer disagreement. You can offer whatever you want. If there's something else you want me to talk about in upcoming broadcasts, feel free to share it right there. You can put it this way. I'm always available when I'm live on the air to communicate with you. Even if I can't address the issue right then and there, I will at least take note of it and then talk about it whenever I can. So always feel free to, feel free to communicate with me that way. You can also communicate with me via email anytime. Email me at newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. Email me questions, thoughts, comments. Um, if you listen to us via YouTube, then by all means, add comments. I try to check them as much as possible. Just a reminder to all the YouTube listeners, the YouTube channel is, it's just there, not, and it's nothing I have any control over. I can't change the look of the channel. I can't, there's nothing I can do. Uh, The reason why is basically, I do a live broadcast and our podcast hosting site, Spreaker, just automatically uploads the episodes to YouTube. I don't have any control over anything beyond that. I can comment, but I don't, I don't even, um, I don't check YouTube a lot. I do try to check at least once, maybe every other day. Sometimes I try at least once a day to check to see if there is a comment. I will try to respond in the comment section. I will do my best, but if you put, if you, If you posted a comment and I did not reply, I apologize. Sometimes I don't even see the notification. So by all means, just email me at newsif at yahoo.com and tell me that I missed your comment. And I will definitely make up for that and do what I can to uh, address the issue. So by all means, feel free to contact me. Now, we have a lot to do today. I have a stack of stuff. Once again, a stack of stuff. Now, remember the Theology Central podcast. This is the place where I try to make theology central to everything going on in the world. And we, I I really just like the idea. Again, these are live broadcasts. There's no editing. It's not always polished. It's not always perfect, but it's very real. And it's just the idea that I turn on the microphone and I ask you to stop by and Listen, and we basically try to figure out this Christian life together. We we try to help each other on. You, you communicating with me helps me. I try to provide my perspective to you, and hopefully we are sharp, you know, iron sharpeneth iron. Hopefully we're encouraging and exhorting one another as we try to make sense of the Christian life and continue down the, the path in front of us in our, in our spiritual journey. So that's kind of what this uh, podcast is about. I think some people get it. Some people don't, um, but, you know, and, and I, the reason, I guess the reason I mentioned that is the other day I was just trying to figure out, you know, maybe, maybe I need a more clear identity to what the Theology Central podcast is. And then I'm thought, no, actually I don't. It's, it's a podcast where a real person who's not perfect, who has his own problems and flaws, who's trying to figure out the Christian life and been trying to figure out the Christian life. Ever since the day I became a Christian, uh, dealing with all of the craziness within Christianity, the craziness within the church, asking questions, struggling, trying to figure it all out. And I just tend to do it live on the air. And I just ask you to stop by and we kind of go through it together. So I think that's kind of the identity. I don't know um, (laughs) that at least... It's it's always hard. You have kind of in your mind, okay, this is kind of what I want the podcast to be like. And either A, I don't do a good enough job of communicating that, or B, maybe how I envision the podcast is always changing. But once again, that captures the idea that I'm just a person sitting behind the microphone trying to figure out life and trying to figure out Christianity, and I'm asking you to participate. So if you are a regular listener, thank you. If you're new, by all means, let us know. And um, 
If you listen to us via the Apple podcast, if you could, <laughs> if you could help us out. Oh, we've had a, a recent string of people giving us negative ratings on uh, on Apple. Uh, we were like at 4.8, 4.9. I think we're down to three something now. So people are giving us negative and fine. I mean, look, if you want to give us negative that way, then I, you know, you're free to do so. And I know, you know, by doing that, you're trying to hurt the podcast from being found. I understand that. Um, but if you do have something completely against me, you can email me around the clock, newsif at yahoo.com. And longtime listeners know I always respond. Maybe there's a delay, but I always respond. So, um, but if you are a, a fan of the show, if you could give us a five-star rating, that would really be helpful and maybe try to make up for that. So anything you can do to help. Now, just a couple of things before we get started today, uh, or just really one ma- major thing. I guess I've already given you a couple of things. Um, next week, starting Monday, my wife heads to Boston. So there's going to be my normal schedule is going to kind of get changed a little bit. So Monday, I don't know how what Monday's going to look like. Uh, I'll be here sometime Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Any broadcast will probably occur in the evening. I'll probably drive here to the church in the early, late afternoon, early evening time time slot and go live. And then there's a very good chance that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and maybe even Saturday, there could be a chance of a lot of lo- a late night live broadcast coming to you from my house. Uh, maybe 10 o'clock at night, midnight, one o'clock in the morning. I don't know. I may turn on the microphone, do some devotional thoughts, or just talk about anything. There may be some impromptu live broadcast as well. So I don't know, uh, whatever, if you've kind of gotten used to kind of my normal schedule, you can just kind of throw that out next week and we'll see how everything unfolds. But I will do my best to bring you hopefully a lot of interesting and thoughtful content. Now, are you ready? If, let's start this with some questions, all right? I want you to really, really, really think about it. When you think of the modern church today, when you think of the church in the, and, and you can, you can, and you can, I guess, insert your country here, but I'm going to speak for America. When you consider the church in the United States of America, how much of the church today, what it does, what it believes, how it acts, how it conducts itself, how much of it do you think still reflects anything that would have been found in the early Christian church? How much of the church today still reflects the early church and how much of the church today reflects absolutely nothing that would have been found in the early church. How, what is the, when you look at what the church has evolved into today, how far removed are we from the early church? Now, let's be fair. A lot of people say, oh, we want to go back to the early church. We want to go back to the early church. But in reality, they don't. I think that's a nice slogan, but I don't, I don't think we do. So how much of what we have today has turned into something else. It's, it's, it's turned into a, you know, a business. It's turned into an industry. It's turned into, you know, a, a, you know, it's turned into something other than being the church. And what can we do to try to fix that and combat that? Now we've been talking about the church in a, a lot of different broadcasts under the VBC podcast uh, during, I think it was episode 30 in our study of the Niagara Creed. We got to the point in the creed, a paragraph 10 or point 10, that starts talking about the church. I raised some very important questions in regards to even should the word church appear in the English translation? Is the word church even a correct translation of ecclesia? Should it be should it be translated differently? And I went through the history of that, and that created a lot of controversy. But I, the question needs to be asked, and, and the subject needs to be studied. So we started talking about it there, and then. It, it moved over from the VBC podcast to the Theology Central podcast, where I've continued kind of challenging you. I want you to really stop and just look, look at your church. Look at everything it does and what it looks like and how it operates. Does that, does it reflect anything of what the church is supposed to be according to scripture? Or do you see, well, I see elements, but it's got all of this other stuff. And I think there's a lot of other stuff And we really need to think about it. So to continue or to add to that discussion, I did a Bible study exercise. 
right? I did a Bible study exercise, and that Bible study exercise leads us to 1 Timothy. If you have a Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, it leads us and led us to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. In 1 Timothy, we have Paul writing to Timothy, and he tells him this. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Go back to verse 14 for context. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. So Paul has been writing to Timothy and dealing with all kinds of things related to the church. Hey, I've been, I, you know, I, I'm hoping to come to you shortly, but I've written all of these things to you. And why? And look what he says, verse 15. Uh, sec, uh, 1 Timothy 3, 15. But if I tarry long, so Paul's saying, look, if, I, if there's a delay, if I cannot, you know, show up, if I cannot arrive, I, I have written these things to you. But if I tarry long, I want you to know how you ought to behave in the house of God. Well, I'll read it from the King James. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, 1 Timothy 3.15 is a significant verse because it tells us a, a number of things about the church. One, the church here is referred to as the house of God. And the phrase house of God should lead us back to the Old Testament where the tabernacle is called the house of God and the temple is referred to as the house of God. But in the New Testament, what we, what is, what the word we use for ecclesia, the ecclesia, the assembly, the congregation is the house of God. And the word that we've kind of placed there is the word church. So it's the house of God. It is the church, the congregation, the assembly of the living God, and it is the pillar and ground of the truth. Some very important words there describing a little bit about the nature of the church, what the church is, and what and how and what's one of the main focuses or what one of the main missions of the church should be. So it says a lot. Now we worked a lot, we worked a lot. In the verse, in part one, and then in part two, remember, I grabbed the Edify Christian Podcast app, just typed in 1 Timothy 3.15, hit episodes, and the very first sermon that uh, pulled up, I grabbed that sermon, and we started working through it. We made it to like the 21-minute mark, and remember, probably one of the most important things that we heard in uh, the, the, the review and critique of the sermon and we're going we're gonna to finish that up today, was that in that sermon, he took the phrase house of God and he argued that it probably, I mean, he didn't come right out and say it should be translated this way, but he basically argued this is how we should understand it. House of God, we should understand that as family of God. And that one of the, and then he made the emphasis that basically one of the missions of the church is the church is to provide a family for those who have been disenfranchised from a, having a family or for, from family life. So this emphasizes immediately what I found fascinating is he took the term house of God and he really made it about us. And I think the term house of God signifies that the church belongs to God and God should be the main focus in the church, not us. But he turned it in, in this sermon that we were critiquing that it's about it, the church is the family of God and it's to provide a family for those disenfranchised from family life. They can come to the church and experience it. Now, I challenged that outright. I ticked off a number of people who emailed me and told me that I was wrong, but that's okay. I just think if you come to church and you think that in church, you're going to find the family life that you were disenfranchised from because you grew up in a bad family, I'm telling you, you're gonna get discouraged. You're gonna get upset. You're gonna get frustrated and you're probably going to leave the church. And here's the reason why. You know what the church is made up of? Sinners. You know what families are made up of? And sinners. And guess what happens in every family? You get hurt, bad things happen, you get discouraged, 
You may be betrayed. You may be lied about. You may be slandered. People may abandon you. They may turn their back on you. They may hurt you. They may attack you. They may lie about you. And those exact same things happen inside the church. Now, I know Christians love to believe, no, 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 in the church, we're Christians. We're new creatures. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. And we understand that not talking about our position, but practically. And then people get into the church and guess what they find out? People let you down. People still sin. People lie. People gossip. People hurt you and and stab you in the back and and stab you in the front, lie to your face, or just say mean things to your face. And people have all kinds of horror stories of what they experienced in the church. To say that this passage is saying, hey, guys, the household of God is the family of God, and the church is to provide a family relationship for those who've missed out. That is a recipe for discouragement, despondency, depression, and uh, I think ultimately will lead you to abandon the church. I was disenfranchised from a normal family life growing up. It was an absolute mess. It was a train wreck. But I've been in the church long enough to tell you stories about the crazy things I have experienced. I have seen fighting, backbiting, lying, you know, people making plans in the background that nobody else knows about so that they can take over this and they can take over that and they can implement their agenda. Just messed up things. So many messed up things I have seen in the church and you have as well. And so if you come to the church thinking, oh, it's the family of God and I'm going to get this this nice family relationship. I, I just know it's the house of God. It's the household of God. It's it, The emphasis is it belongs to God. This is God's church. The emphasis is on God, not on us. The minute we make it about us, problems ensue. And so I, I really challenge the sermon in part to go back and listen. Um, I've backed up the sermon here that we were reviewing to catch a little of that, but I want to just go ahead and offer my critique right here at the start, and then we will see if we can finish this up, all right? So 1 Timothy 3.15, that's uh, how long did we review? 17 minutes, all right? So now there were some announcements in there as well, but I think that's that's the best I can do. I know that my perspective there is very cynical. You may say, wow, that's so negative. It's so cynical. It's so... You sound like you're, you're, you know, you've already given up and uh, declared defeat. It's just the reality. Once the church becomes about you and some emotional need for companionship, community, friendship, whatever, people always get hurt and let down. Well, the church, they weren't nice to me. They did this. They did that. Everyone's got a million issues. Well, you know why? Because the church is made up of sinful people and the church's primary design is not there to meet all of your emotional needs. It's there for a different purpose. Right here in 1 Timothy 3.15, the emphasis is on being the ground and pillar of the truth. What does that mean? That's the emphasis, I think. But, But a lot of people take that term house translate it household of God, and then make it, or translate it family of God, and say that that's what the church is designed to do. And I just think that that's problematic. All right. Now, let's jump back in. And remember, when we jump back in, it's always kind of abrupt. There's no easy way to just enter back in or just kind of pick up. Um, We were at the 21 minute left mark, and we're now back to the 20 minute. Um, Yeah, we, we backed up a little bit. Well, I think we're at 26 minutes left to go. So we backed up about five or six minutes just to try to offer some kind of uh, consistency and continuity. All right, here we go. For some people, this church may be the only real family that, will, that they will ever know. Now, I know this from Scripture. I think that's what's being said here and in other parts of Scripture. But I also know it from personal experience. My familial pedigree has never been considered very impressive. I'm the son of a bartender, a very heavy drinker, which brought a lot of dysfunction into our family for myself and my two younger sisters and especially for my mom. The son of a bartender, the grandson of a Detroit gangster. My first encounter with family, as it was ordained by God to be, was in the context of a local church. All right, now here we go. 
So he had he had a, a bad family experience. So his first experience of a real family was the church. Now, see, that sounds so good and that's so wonderful. I could tell you the exact same story. I grew up and I could tell you all the horrible things that happened in my family. So then I became a part of a church. And how did that work out for me? How did that work out for me? Okay, I could tell you all the messed up things that happened, you know, in that church. And all the other churches that I've ever been a part of. Crazy things, splits, all just, it's just no. So, it, it doesn't, it, the idea is, is the purpose of the church to provide you the family experience you missed out on. Now, I, I'm going to join your church, but I want you to know that I'm looking for a family to make up for the family that I never had. Now, those are the kinds of needs that a lot of people don't express when they're looking to join a church. But in many cases, it's really the, it's really the needs and the desires that is paramount to them. They just don't feel very spiritual in saying it. I wish people would just say that when they call, you know, hey, we're looking for a church and this is what I need. I need you to provide a family experience because I didn't have one growing up. That's what I need. I wish some people would just say, that's what I'm looking for. And then I can say, okay, that's what you want. Um, that I, I'm, that I don't feel that that's, that that's the primary purpose of the church. If you experience that in the church, there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying that that no matter the good you experience, you're going to experience all the bad that family brings in as well. Because sinful people, they're, they're sinful. The people outside of the church are sinful. The people inside the church are sinful. The people outside the church sin. The people inside the church sin. And no matter how much we try to play down the sin inside the church and we try to cover it up and we try to you know put on fig leaves to cover up our shame and guilt, it's there and sooner or later it is seen and it is experienced and it is realized. All right, let's continue. In the small village of Montrose, Michigan, where I was raised, I can say that I brought nothing of value or status to the small community of believers in Montrose Baptist Church except my eternal soul as a creature made in the image of God. And that was enough for that body of believers, that miniature body of believers. The church is still there. It's still biblical, still preaching the gospel. It's a church of about 60 or 65 people when I first connected, meeting in a little country schoolhouse. About 35 of the members of that church were teenagers who were pumped about Jesus Christ. And I rubbed shoulders with them on a daily basis in my public school and was attracted to them. The light that was in them was a loving rebuke to the darkness that was in Doug, and the salt that they were gave me a thirst for what they had. For the first time as a teenager in a local Baptist church, I saw, felt, and experienced, at least vicariously, the warmth and wealth of a real family. And through that experience and the exposure to the gospel, that it provided for me, I came to personal faith in Jesus Christ as a 16-year-old boy. Montrose Baptist Church was, to me, God's good family in my broken world. And I think that is precisely what Paul was calling all of us to be in this text that we are addressing. So I want you to realize this, that he is literally, dogmatically asserting that the way we are to interpret 1 Timothy 3.15 is that it's emphasizing, hey, Timothy, the church needs to be the family of God and you need to provide for everyone the family relationship that they have been deprived of, that they they, they did not experience. That's your responsibility, Timothy. That is literally, he is offering that up as a dogmatic interpretation that that's the correct interpretation of that passage. And I don't think he's done anything to prove that. He's completely ignored the cross-reference of the phrase house of God with tabernacle and temple. He's clearly downplayed the emphasis being on God. It's God's house. It's the, it's the church of the living God. It's the assembly of the living God. It belonging to God. He has downplayed that and he's emphasized that it's primary. It, I mean, you almost could argue he's, he's I, I don't, maybe he hasn't used that word. 
it, it seems to be implied that the primary mission of the church is to provide this kind of family experience. Because if you provide that kind of family experience, then it's almost implied that people then will get saved. So if you provide them the family experience, they will get saved. Well, again, uh, is sinful people. Yeah, you'll. I mean, just just go go go. I just challenge you. Call if you're on Facebook, social media, wherever. Just ask all of your friends, all the people you know. Call them, email them, say, "Hey, you went to church, or you, you know, tell me about your experience in church." Uh, just t- describe. Have your experiences been good? Tell me the bad, and just hear some of the horror stories that people have experienced in church. What happened? Well, if the church is supposed to provide this wonderful family experience, I mean, look at 1 Corinthians. Whoa, you talk about a dysfunctional family. The thing was an absolute disaster and a mess. And people were going to the church at Corinth for a family relationship that they had been deprived of. Well, guess what? They, they, they were only going to, they were going to become very discouraged and give up and stop going to church. No, the church is the house of God. We go there to hear from God preached from the word, to worship him, to pray to him, just like they went to the temple. They went to the tabernacle and the focus was on God. They went to the temple. The focus was on God. I think that church, that's, that's where I think we've gone. We, we have turned the church into a place that's not emphasizing God, but it's emphasizing people and their felt needs. And the church is now a place designed to meet people's felt needs. And I, I think it's problematic. Now, yes, do I wish the church would, would be better? Yes, I wish it would be better. But the reality is it's made up of sinful people and it's going, and people are going to let you down and you're going to get hurt. And you're going to get discouraged. And at some point you're just going to give up and stop going to church because of the way people acted and treated you. I mean, I can give you countless examples just where it, it's oh, just ugliness. And then when I hear people tell me stories, I'm always like, you you got to be kidding. That did not happen in that. That did not happen. That did not, no way did that happen. You you you're making that up. But then you know they they they're telling their experiences and they're it's usually not good. We are the family of God. And there are people all around of us all around us who need that family. I like to say, and my, my wife always wants me to say it, that my father came to live with us the last eight years of his life. And after a four-year journey in our home at the age of 72, he said, Doug, I want to talk to you. And we sat down and he said, Doug, I want to become a Christian. And I led my dad to Christ when he was 72. He died when he was 76 for four years. Sanctification set in. That's not quite enough to clean everything up. But it was enough for him to say, to learn how to say I love you. Now, a couple of things. This is so common, and especially in the evangelical world, Protestant world, where you have this testimonial kind of thing. And, and always the implication is, see, the reason, you know, it, it's almost implied, maybe not explicitly, but it's there, okay? Maybe it's not explicit, but it's, it's definitely implied, I guess. So it's not explicitly stated, it's implied that, hey, you know what? See, if you've got someone who's lost, if they move in with you and see your family, then see, that'll work. So in other words, all you got to do is demonstrate the right kind of Christianity and someone will get saved. Let me make it very clear. The, the human heart is dead and trespasses and sins. And just demonstrating the right, the correctness of Christianity or living it out correctly before them is not the thing that convinces them to be saved. It requires a sovereign act of God to resurrect that dead sinner to life. And so, but I guess if you believe in it, uh, maybe a semi-Pelagian way or a Pelagian way, then maybe you can argue, oh, that would work. But I just, you know, I just, I would think Israel, Israel got to see a lot of evidence and proof that God existed and they still turned their back on God and turned to idols and turned to idolatry over and over and over and over again, because the unregenerate heart is not going to become saved just by demonstrating that. I'm not saying we shouldn't demonstrate it, just saying that I always hear these stories. And so then when you're listening, you're like, oh man, if we would have done better, 
If we would have done better, that person would have got saved. If I would have done better, that if I would have did this better, if we would have did that, and, and then you just live with eternal guilt, you know, oh, and not, well, not eternal, but you'll live with a, a long lasting guilt here on earth because you feel like that you didn't do enough to, to get that person saved. And that places the burden of salvation on you getting someone saved, but you, it doesn't work that way. All right. But all right, here we go. But remember, he's using this illustration to talk about this is what the church should do. So the church is really supposed to, we go out there and get people who are lost, who need family. We bring them into the church, which is again completely opposite to the way the biblical model, the biblical models we go and teach, they believe, then we baptize and bring them into the church. So this starts turning the church and you bring, hey, all you people out there, you need a family, come here to the church, we'll show you family. And then in the process of showing you family, then we'll show you the gospel. So then it turns the church in, I guess, to a body made up of unbelievers who need family, we get, we meet that felt need, and then we can present the gospel to them. This really turns the whole biblical model of the church upside down because the church is the household of the house of God. It's the church of the living God. And it's the church is designed to, it's the bride of Christ. It's supposed to be pleasing Christ. And it is supposed to be, let me make this very clear. It is supposed to be equipping saints. So really this, this, this model that he's putting forth creates a whole different concept of church. And how to settle an argument without blowing the house apart. And to say when I would go away with in those days less Olala to preach in various contexts or teach in this context or that, my dad would say, Doug, I'll be praying for you. My bartender dad was going to be praying for me. I give thanks to God for his work in my dad's life, my mother's life, and others in our family. So Paul says, you are the family of God. Be what you are. This is what you are. Be what you are. Where God has sovereignly and strategically placed you in this wonderful, perhaps somewhat affluent, but terribly needy community. And be all that God intends for you to be as the family of God, a home base for the familially disenfranchised. They're all around us. Secondly, the church is the community of life. It's a life base for the spiritually dead. You secondly, Paul. Okay, so first, the church is designed for those who've been disenfranchised or, or you know, deprived of family life. And now it's a, 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 a I'm, and now I've got a paraphrase here because I did not write down that phrase. It's a, basically as a place of, it's a place of life for those who are dead. Now, I'm, I'm really now really perplexed. Are you talking about dead in your trespasses and sins? So you're saying now the church is designed for those dead in their trespasses and sins? Is is that? I, I'm 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 becoming more confused by the second as we listen to this. But I, that's what I want to demonstrate to you is this. This is just remember this was just chosen at random. I just went to the Edify Christian Podcast app, typed in First Timothy three fifteen, hit episodes, and just chose the first one I saw. Now this is why I'm doing this. Because I want you to just see that every church has their own perspective of what the church should be, what the church should emphasize, what the church should do. And I am telling you that I think more and more and more when you just go from church to church to church to look, that so much of it, I can't give you a percentage, 70%, 80%, 90%, just it's turned into something that doesn't even reflect what the early church was or its purpose or its mission, or its commission, and I, that should bother you. It should. It makes you just go, well, what's the point of even going to church if the church no longer even reflects what the church was supposed to be? All right, let's continue. Paul refers to the, to the body of believers there as the ecclesia of the living God, the gathered community called out from the world system, gathered together as the people of God to conduct God's redemptive business on planet earth, you are the church of the living God. Now, make sure we understand the passage is emphasizing house of God is emphasizing God. The church of the living God is emphasizing God. So is this, is he going to emphasize the, the, the living God is, or is he going to emphasize spiritual life given to us? 
What, what is the, what's the emphasis in the text? It's just so interesting that you can listen to a preacher take a text that's emphasizing one thing and watch them flip it completely on its head so that they can emphasize something that the text is not emphasizing and everyone sits in the pew going, amen, amen. Because as long as it sounds good, nobody seems to go, wait a minute. And remember, you can say true things and you can say things in a good way, but if you're saying them based off a text that's not saying them, then that turns all of those good things you're saying actually into something bad because you're saying that it comes from a text that's not saying what you claim it's saying. So I'm very, what's the emphasis getting ready to be here? Let's see where the emphasis is getting ready to go. So it's no surprise that biblical churches like this one, and I know this is true of this church, God has blessed this ministry over these many years. I can see it every time I come and sense it and feel it and know it. But it's no surprise that biblical churches are living, pulsating entities. They are suffused with the life of the living God. Scripture, scripture always defines God as the living God. makes quite an issue of it, Old Testament and New Testament. Hebrew scriptures and Christian scriptures. The life of the living God. Always defined, God is always defined as the living God and always in deliberate contrast to the lifeless and useless idols which plague every generation and every culture on planet earth and they they plague our generation as well. Money, sex, and power. The unholy trinity, the triune Godhead, small g of the devil. The living God replaces all of that. The Apostle Paul defines Christian conversion as nothing less than turning to God, that's faith, away from idols, I think that's repentance. Conversion is turning to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9. And when we turn toward God in faith, the living God imparts his life to us too. You hath he quickened, the old King James says. It's antiquated language, but it's beautiful. You hath he quickened. You hath he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. And where does the living God live? We all know. So I won't spend long here. We all know where he lives. First, God lives in each and every believer individually because our bodies, Paul said, are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. So we know he lives there. He lives in us in some mysterious, I guess. It's a mystery. He takes up residence in the human spirit somehow. Our dead human spirit is impregnated with the life of the divine Holy Spirit, and we are quickened and made alive and inhabited by that Holy Spirit. One of the things this means is that when we become Christians, when you became a Christian, God did not give things to you. He gave himself to you. And that he did that because he knows that's what we need. We don't need things. We need him. He gives himself to us. He lives within us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I think it is possible to have, particularly in our kind of affluent world, it is possible to have everything that you want only to discover sooner or later that you do not want anything that you have. Because they always disappoint, if that's where our focus is. Things don't have it in them to meet our needs. Only Jesus Christ does. So individually, Christ lives in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Where does does the living God live? He lives in you and in me. But he also lives and dwells, the living God dwells in the church corporately. Not only in us individually, but in the church corporately. Because the gathered community, as we are this morning, you're the gathered community here of believers in Eden Baptist Church. The gathered community, the church met together as the congregation in local assembly is the habitat of God. It's the dwelling place of God. Paul said so in Ephesians 2 verse 22, in whom you, and and, and that second person personal pronoun is plural, referring to the whole corporate body met together, in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in or by the Spirit, Ephesians 2.22. The church corporately is the community of life because it's inhabited by the living God. He's here with us in a very unique and special and powerful sense every time we gather together. 
Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. All the little words in the Bible are Okay, now we got to stop right there. Where two or three are gathered in my name. Or two or three, that, that passage is where two or three are gathered in my name for the purpose of church discipline. That's found in the Gospel of Matthew. I wish people would stop ripping that verse so far out of its context. So he's emphasizing a lot about us, 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 us here. Let me just read from one commentary because it was just sitting here on the table. So while he was talking, I just reached over and grabbed it. Let me just give you an idea. Paul further defines the assembly of believers as the church of the living God or the living God's church. The the absence of the definite article with church stresses its character. This is describing the character of the church. The church by its very nature belongs to the living God. In fact, Paul to the Ephesian elders at the gathering of Miletus that the church of God was truly his because he had purchased it with his own blood, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. In his letter to Ephesus, he called the church God's own possession to the praise of his glory. The identification of the creator as the living God has a rich Old Testament heritage Uh, Joshua told the Israelites, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will surely dispose from before you the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Hivite, the Perizzite, et cetera, et cetera, all right? So he goes through all the Old Testaments demonstrating that God is the living God, the living God, the living God. The description uh, of the Ephesian assembly as the living God's church was especially apropos. It was the island of light and a dark sea of pagan worship. Crucial to behaving properly in the uh, uh, crucial to behaving properly is the knowledge that the assembly of saints is the living God's church. So this emphasizes that this just emphasizes that the church belongs to God, the living God. It's His church. The emphasis is not on us. The emphasis is on the living God, not on us living, not on us being infused with life. The emphasis is it's God's church and he's the living God. So in other words, it wasn't his church in the past, but it's no longer. It was his church in the past. It's his church in the present and it will be his church in the future. Yesterday, today, and forever, to borrow a phrase from a TV show, but I won't go into that. Okay, that that's the idea. He's, he seems to be getting ready to make the emphasis once again about us, right? Let's, and remember, he, now he's only got 17 minutes left, and guess what he's yet to do? He's not even got into the pillar and ground of the truth. He's not even, so his emphasis is on, hey, it's a family for those who need a family, and it's a place of life for those who are dead. Now, I want to see how he explains how it accomplishes that. Let's see what he says. Important. This is the little Greek particle eke, E-K-E-I, eke. It means in that place, literally, the lexicon says. For where two or three to gather together in my name, in that place, I am with them. And where is he? In the middle of them, in the midst of them. And that Greek word meso for midst means in the very middle of them. Every time we And the idea, when the church gathers for church discipline, he is there in the midst. And then it gets to the idea of what they bind is bound, what they loose is loose. And that is the binding of discipline and the loosening of forgiveness. That's what that's referencing. I don't know why it's so complicated. I don't know why it's so so convoluted to so many American Christians. The text is obvious. If you need help me explaining that, I can. That text where two or three are gathered, the context is there, gathered in church discipline. And then what they bind is bound in heaven. What they loose is loose. And that's referring to church discipline. Again, it's not binding and loosening how other people use it. I mean, the text is, it's not even convoluted. It's not even complicated. It's not even difficult. It's just basic reading fundamentals there. But okay, all right, let's continue. We gather together. There is a unique almost mysterious presence of God with the people of God. The living God settles not amongst us in a unique and powerful way. Whenever we gather together as a corporate body for worship and service, he's right in the midst of us, right there with us, watching and weighing all that is going on and 
And this is why we should be driven never to do anything that might offend his watching eyes or his listening ears or his holy heart. Why is this so important? Does this have anything to do with mission and ministry? Why is it so important that you are a community of life, a living, pulsating body with the energy and the dynamism of God himself? See where the emphasis just went? It just shifted from, you no, know, this the church belongs to the living God to no, you are a church made up of people who have the life of God in you. He now just switched it over and emphasized the people, not emphasized the God. House of God emphasizes God. Church of the living God emphasizes God. So the, I think what Paul wants Timothy to understand is, hey, you need to know how to behave in the, ho- in, in, in the, the house of God. Uh, if you're going to know how to behave, you have to begin with the understanding that the church isn't about you. It's about God. It's not about anybody else. It's about God. It belongs to God. It's his possession. It belongs, it, it, it belongs to him. So we must follow his design, his purpose, his commission, his will. That's the, that to me is the starting point. But he's just completely obliterated that emphasis. Um, And we'll see if he's going to do something with ground and pillar. He's got 16 minutes and 30. He's been preaching for 27 minutes and 26 seconds, 27 minutes and 26 seconds. He took the first Timothy 315, I think, which is emphasizing the centrality of God and God having the preeminence. He's made it about us and he's not even got to those two very important concepts of ground and pillar. Let's see what he does here. The living God at work in you and among you as you come together and through you before the watching world. The reason that this idea of your being a community of life is important is because we live in a culture that is suffused with, de- with death. Our cultural preoccupation, rather, our cultural justification of abortion, 62 million plus since Roe v. Wade, our cultural justification of that procedure of abortion and even infanticide, born alive but not protected. Our cultural justification of abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, and physician-assisted suicide is graphic evidence of our love affair with death. And I don't think it's too too strong to say that, a love affair with death. I love the 8th chapter of Proverbs. It's an essay on God's wisdom, on divine wisdom. And wisdom speaks out in in, in that chapter, Proverbs 8. We don't have time to go there. Wisdom is personified as a lovely lady in Proverbs 8. And the Bible says that she raises her voice on the heights, at the crossroads, beside the gate, which would be the city hall of a city the gate where the official business was transacted, and at the entrance of the portals, all of it in the public square, and this is where divine wisdom is missing and where it's desperately needed, in the public square. Wisdom makes her appeal to the stubborn and to the simpleton and to the fool and to everybody else who passes by. And what does she say? The last two verses of Proverbs 8, this is what she says, for whoever finds me finds life, exactly, Divine wisdom is all about life, not death. Whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me, our culture despises. We live in a culture that despises God's wisdom. Romans one twenty eight. they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They excised God from their thought constructs from their body of knowledge, from their wisdom. They did not like to retain God there. All those that hate me love death. And that is what is happening in our culture. Abortion and infanticide, euthanasia, and physician-assisted. I don't, I don't quite know what to say. Who knew that you could use 1 Timothy 3.15 to speak about abortion. I, I just don't, I just don't know 
Okay, he's got 13 minutes and 50 seconds left. Now, most likely if he has a concluding prayer and then his summary at the end, that means he's probably got about 12 minutes. So ground and pillar of the truth at best is going to get 12 minutes of attention. And so far, he's put all of the emphasis on the church is a family for those who disenfranchise from family life. And it's a place of life for those who are dead, but he's not yet really articulated what that means, what that looks like, other than I guess the church is just that when people walk walk in, they see life. I I, I don't know exactly. He's not really even articulated exactly what that looks like and exactly what it means. He, it's, it's kind of like a vague concept with no real tangible principles. And now it's about, Abortion, and so uh, yeah, okay. Well, I'm, I'm I'm trying to follow, but that's okay. Let's let's see where he goes. Suicide. Peter Singer, one of the world's leading international bioethicists who teaches at Princeton University, has said and written many ugly things, terrible things, bestiality, and all the rest. It's all there in print has said that nobody has a right to live just because they're human. And every young couple should have the right to make a decision after the birth of a child, maybe up to 12 months, maybe up to 18 months, to make the decision whether or not they really want this child and want to keep it. Maybe it's too much trouble. We can't do all the things we used to do. We've lost our freedom. Nobody has a right to live just because they're human, he said. And if you decide within that prescribed, according to him, period of time that you don't want the child, then just euthanize him. Our culture has a love affair with death. This is why this community of life, you speak life into this world. This is why the church is the community of life, living and doing ministry in a culture of death, resonates with some of the deepest needs of our time. Every authentic body of believers must proclaim the message of life in Jesus Christ. But it must do more than that. It must model the life-transformative impact of that eternal life on each one of our individual lives so, so that people get the message that Jesus Christ really makes a difference in a person's life, in a marriage, in a family, in a community of faith. They need to see that. You're the community of life that resonates. So he's, he's turned this into almost a commandment. Hey, the church, it's the church of the living God, meaning you now must demonstrate God's life in a world. And if you don't, then, you know, they're not going to see it. I I am perplexed and how this turned into a command, how the, this to me is descriptive. It's the house of God, the church of the living God. It's descriptive. It's describing ownership. It's describing the, who it belongs to, its character. That's what it's doing. And it's turned into, I don't even quite know how this, I, I, uh, the, the emphasis on what would be the purpose or the mission of the church is to be the ground and pillar of the truth. That, but he's yet to emphasize that at all. And now we're at 11 minutes and 55 seconds. If we take probably closing pr- prayer and summary, that means he's got about 10 minutes, maybe if that, to deal with ground and pillar of the truth, which to me is the most essential part of this verse and trying to understand, okay, how is the church the ground and pillar of the truth, right? What does that mean? Does that mean the church is the source of truth? Therefore, the church can define truth and then you have to submit to it because the church has this authority to define truth and defend truth. Therefore, you must submit to the church's authority when it comes to their proclamations about truth. Or is it the idea that the church is simply holding up the truth of scripture and you must submit to the scripture, not necessarily to the authority and power of the church? This verse is instrumental and critical for anyone who's ever studied church history, but he's not even put the emphasis on that at all. He's not even going to deal with all of the historical uh, ramifications of this verse. He's just made it about, hey, the church is about us. It's about us. It's about us. It's about you. 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 And I, okay, 
Hey, we got 11 minutes, 55 seconds. We'll, we'll see if he what, he what he does. In the, maybe he's going to say something so profound about the church being the pillar and ground of the truth that it's going to make it worthwhile, everything else. Let, let's see. With the needs of our times. In my opinion, we should all have the spirit of the prodigal's father when his rebellious son came to his senses and returned home. You know the story of the prodigal son. The father said, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Why? For this my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to be merry. The church... The body of Christ, the local assembly, is the community which God has made alive. It's populated by people who were lost and are now found, who were dead and who are now alive. And every time we gather for worship, we should do it the way we did this morning. It was wonderful. We should have the spirit of the prodigal's father. We should be joyful in God every time, every day we should be joyful. We were dead. And now we are alive. We were lost and now we are found. We should be joyful in God, worshipful in spirit, biblical in conviction, and missional in heartbeat. That is, longing for others to taste of this life as well. Because we are the community of life in a world suffused with death. We are a life base for the spiritually dead. That's what Paul says we are. That's what we are at Family Baptist downtown where Lee Ormerson pastors. He's a godly and a wonderful pastor. We're the life base for those who are spiritually dead. So the spiritually dead should come here because we're the base and that we have life. And then, again, he, the whole thing sees, turns church into something. The church is the place that, the, that believers gather for the purpose of being equipped for the ministry to go out and then take the message of life out. I, I, am, I, don't, I am so perplexed here with what he's doing with this passage. He's take a passage that so emphasizes God's preeminence, and he's making it all about us, 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 us. It's like, I, I, I'm, okay. Now we're down to 10 minutes and 24 seconds left. If you take, I'm assuming there's going to be about a minute for closing prayer and summary. So that means he's got probably about nine minutes to deal with the ground and pillar of the truth. Nine minutes. Clearly, he's not even going to deal with the two Greek words for ground and pillar. Clearly, he's not going to deal with the historical implications and claims made about the verse. Clearly, I, 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 I guess he's going to really downplay that part of it. He's emphasized the house of God and the church of the living God. He's emphasized that to make it about us, and he's downplaying the other. Now, I know every time when you preach, you have to make choices. Well, no, actually, you know, no, and you know what? I take that back. You never have to make a choice, right? Because you can emphasize Everything in the text, it just may take two sermons to do so. It may take three sermons, or it may take you to preach a little longer. You you don't have to ever cut anything out. You just may have to say, you know what? I don't have time to get to this. So in this message, we're going to deal with these two phrases, household, house of God, the church of the living God. We're going to deal with that, and we're going to ignore the pillar and ground until a later time. Right. So you, you, you could have done that. All right, but here, here we go. 10 minutes and 24 seconds left. Every New Testament local church is the family of God in a world of fractured families. It's the community of life in a world suffused with death. And I have only a few moments. I don't know when I'm supposed to get done, but I got to get done pretty soon, I think. Third, the church is the sanctuary of truth. It's a truth base for the tragically deceived because Paul says you are, in addition to all the rest of this, you are the pillar and the ground of the truth. Think of that, the pillar and ground of the truth. That's what this and every biblical New Testament local church is. I know that sanctuary is a term that has been politicized and demeaned as a result of it in our culture, but sanctuary is a wonderful term properly understood. The sanctuary is the place of safety and security. It's the place of refuge when someone or something is suffering persecution or affliction. I'm, I'm very perplexed. So we have literally the biblical language, pillar and ground, and now he's inserted a new word, sanctuary. So I guess he's going to make the idea that the church is the sanctuary of truth? Is it the... Is the <clears throat> 
is the text saying that it's a sanctuary or pillar or ground? Why wouldn't you immediately start building on the biblical? Why would you insert a new word when you already have two words there? Right? Why, why wouldn't you emphasize pillar and ground? Now, you, you've got to answer this. Pillar and ground in what way? Does the church simply hold up? In other words, there is a truth external to the church. It's called scripture. Right, I've got my Bible over here. Right? It's, here it is. Here's scripture. I know you can't see it. I'm holding up my Bible. The church is simply to hold it up. Here is the truth. And therefore, it's not the church that it, it defines truth, has the truth, is the authority, it's the scriptures that is the authority. Or is it the church? Like you've got to draw this distinction because it comes so much down to church government, what how people should respond to the church, what when can the people disagree with the church? When can they disagree with the church? When can they how much should they submit? How submissive do they have to be? I mean, this has massive implications on the understanding of the church. So, all right, he's got now nine minutes and 32 seconds, and he's now introduced another word that's not even in the text. That's what a sanctuary is. This is precisely what the church is in behalf of the truth. You are the sanctuary of truth, the pillar and ground of the truth, because truth is being brutalized in our civilization, in the secular academy and media where we expect it, but also in large segments of concessive Christianity where the truth is being demeaned the unfortunate reality now if the if the truth is being demeaned within certain elements of christianity is it being demeaned inside churches and if it's being demeaned inside churches then that means the churches who are quote unquote demeaning the truth according to his understanding because the other the churches that are supposedly demeaning the truth would argue that they're not demeaning the truth they would argue that they're the ground and pillar of the truth and they're holding up the truth so now it comes down to everyone arguing about which truth so if the church is the sanctuary of the truth then that means the church possesses the truth defines the truth delivers the truth therefore you must be submissive to the church but you just acknowledge that there's a large portion of christianity that's attacking the truth well then then who gets to determine which church is the sanctuary of truth what what makes the church the sanctuary of truth Uh, these are these are just basic elementary questions that any good listener of a sermon should should come up with or any good reader of this text and anyone well who's ever studied church history it is that far too many churches have reduced their truth claims because too much truth doesn't foster church growth and people would rather not hear some of that stuff so they reduce their truth claims to the lowest common denominator all right, now, so there's churches out there who have reduced their truth claims, so that means and they're no longer the ground and pillar of the truth. So which church is the ground and pillar of the truth? And what does it mean that they're the ground and pillar of the truth? So clearly some churches are not, according to his definition. Some churches are. So according, I guess, the church he's preaching to, they are. The other churches aren't. I guess he gets to define which churches are and which churches aren't. So then... So that means that means that the church isn't the authority. So why would you call it the sanctuary of the truth? It's the ground and pillar. It, why? Why would you call the church the sanctuary of truth when the Bible does the Bible ever? So here's a question: Does the Bible ever refer to the church as the sanctuary of truth? Ever? Ever? Anywhere? All right. Now, if you're listening live, if you, if if there is a place where it's called the sanctuary of the truth, by all means, show me. Um, because I, I'm not going to look it up right now because we're already over an hour, but um, I'll leave that Bible study exercise, so I don't want to do all the work for you. you. You find me the scripture that says the church is the sanctuary of the truth. Now you say, well, by implication, okay, then do you, then do you show me how the Greek language here would imply it's the sanctuary. To me, ground and pillar, if we understand that simply, that ground and pillar is really just using two different phrases to say one thing, that it holds up the truth, it holds it up, it supports it. There's the truth. The church is simply holding it up, putting it forth. So that then all you have to do is figure out what that truth is. And then the church is the ground and pillar when it's holding that truth. And when it puts that truth down, then it's no longer the ground and pillar, right? So it's, you got to define what the truth is. And if the truth, if we say sola scriptura, then it's, it holds up scripture, right? Okay. 
I'm, I'm just trying to figure this out. Here we go. In order to attract the largest possible crowd, this is a brutalizing of truth. For believers who take Christ's claims on their lives seriously and who are thirsting for authenticity in their personal lives and their local assemblies, this is a clarion call for the body of Christ to be utterly committed to absolute loyalty to absolute truth. I have to park by truth for just a few moments here, not long. This will be my last visit here probably. I think truth, I believe truth is the fundamental moral category in the universe. I believe God is the fundamental reality in the universe, of course. But I believe that God's truth is the fundamental moral category in the universe, and I think there are a lot of biblical texts that would help us to support that idea. The point is that without truth, people and the civilizations they create unravel at the seams, just as ours is unraveling at the seams. And Solomon said it would be so. He said, where there is no revelation, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no revelation, where there is no word from God conveyed through the prophets and disseminated among the people or through the apostles in the New Testament era and disseminated among the people and the culture, where there is no revelation, no truth from God, the people cast off restraint. Exactly. Just look around. It's a very aggressive term. It's one verb, cast off restraint. Parua is the Hebrew verb. It means to run wild. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Look, when I listen to sermons, maybe you don't listen to this way. I try to understand the preacher's like rationale. Like wh why would they do that? So we have ground and pillar. He introduced the word sanctuary. Now he's over in Proverbs. Now he's giving you the Hebrew there, but he's not even bothered to deal with the Greek of ground and pillar. So I'm, I'm pr totally perplexed. If you're going to exegete this, he, he didn't really do much exegeting. I mean, to me, he, he abandoned really any objective meaning of house of God. He, he didn't even do it with the cross references from the Old Testament. Church of the living God, he brought in ecclesia, but he kind of abandoned even maybe the, the, what the, that emphasis there and he turned it about us. Now it's the church is the, 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 the ground and pillar of the truth. And now we're in Proverbs looking up the Hebrew phrase for casting off restraint. I'm, I'm just completely perplexed. In the, in the preaching decision here, like, no, you're preaching 1 Timothy 3.15. Help us understand what, what, how does it work that the church is the ground and pillar of the truth? If the church is the ground and pillar of the truth, then does the church possess any authority in and of itself? And if it does, what, what, what does that look like? Like, this is absolutely critical. I mean, remember the whole purpose of 1 Timothy 3.15? The whole purpose here is Paul is trying to explain to Timothy how he ought to behave in the church. And it seems first it, uh, he wants to understand you need to behave a certain way because the church belongs to God. And number two, you have to behave a certain way because of the church's purpose, which is the ground and pillar of the truth. So I, I'm completely perplexed by this. I, 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 it started off like it was going to be really, really interesting and good, and now it's just getting more and more frustrating by the second, and he's only got six minutes left. So I don't. I think about nine million questions that any person who's ever studied church history would have about 1 Timothy 3.15, we're not going to be uh, given any answers here. To break loose, to let go and to let loose, it means to be unrestrained. It means to give free rein to wild passions. This is how it's used. You'll find it in Exodus 32 in verse 5 at the foot of, the, of Mount Sinai as Moses comes down with the two tablets of the law and all those of those commandments were being broken before his eyes. Exodus 32 in verse 25. In that verse, that verb, parua, is translated twice, naked. They uncover, they let loose, they let go, they break loose, they run wild. In other words, whenever there is a tr truth deprivation, as is happening in some concessive churches, 
people are being deprived of truth, even inside the body of Christ. And please note, so, so again, we're still chasing a Hebrew, a Hebrew phrase, a Hebrew word. And then he continues to say, churches aren't doing this, churches aren't doing this. Okay, well then, is the church the ground and pillar of the truth or not? So when, when, is a ch- when is a church the ground and pillar of the truth? When is a church not the gr- ground and pillar of the truth? How are you to know the difference? And if the church is the ground and pillar of the truth, what is your responsibility to that church? And when can you disagree and when can you decide to leave? Like th- this raises so many questions about authority, purpose of the church. I, I don't even, we're, we're over in Exodus now looking up a Hebrew phrase and, and still not even dealing with the two Greek words for ground and pillar found in 1 Timothy 3.15, which I thought is the passage he's exegeting. Wherever there is a truth deprivation or as there is in our secular society, a truth renunciation, wherever this is, people erupt in irresponsible profligate behavior and public morality descends into the abyss. Exactly what we're living with now. How this church resonates with the need of this world. This is a truth base. Always has been. What humankind needs more than all else is access to the truth. And God has ordained that churches like yours, New Testament local churches, are to be the pillar and ground of the truth. That is our double responsibility to the truth. We are to be the ground of it. That is its support and buttress against all attacks upon it. And we are to be the pillar of it. We're to be the pillar of the truth. As the ground, the church holds truth fast. It won't let go of it. It defends it. As the pillar, it holds truth high. It thrusts truth high. That's what pillars do. They hold things up for all to see. They make things conspicuous and visible before the watching world. In fact, the word pillar, stilos is the Greek word, The word pillar is used in the New Testament of both personal and corporate leadership. In Galatians 2, in verse 9, Paul says that Peter, he's called Cephas there, but it's Peter, Peter, James, and John were pillars. It's the same word, leaders in the church at Jerusalem. And in this text, the local New Testament church is to take the leadership in the body within the the context of the church, but disseminating it into the culture, take the leadership in defending the truth against attack, disseminating, which means to sow the seed. Semnos is the word for seed. To disseminate is to sow the seed. Disseminating the truth into a deceived world and displaying the truth in our own personal lives so that we can't be accused of hypocrisy. And if the church fails in this task, there is nowhere else to go for truth. Nothing is more important than access to truth. Paul says... If the church fails, there's nowhere else to go for truth? (laughs) Uh, Wait a minute here. Now, are we Protestant or are we Catholic here? If the church fails, wouldn't people still have access to truth, which would be Scripture? Are you saying the only way people can get access to the truth is through the church, and that was me throwing my pencil, I apologize. I, I picked up my journal and then my pencil went following. So I, I'm, that's, I know he probably didn't mean it that way, but hey, if the church fails, people have nowhere to go for truth. Nowhere. Just, just, that's it. But at the same time, he's already acknowledged that churches are not doing their job. So churches are not doing their jobs. That means people are failing, or, or therefore people have no place to go for the truth. Or are you saying if all churches fail, then if, if every church became corrupt, would people still not have access to truth in Scripture? Is the church the source of truth, or is Scripture the source of truth, and the church just serves as the ground and pillar of that truth? I mean, this, is become, this is coming very close to almost a Catholic understanding of the church, right? So, all right, let's, and again, he's, he's just, now what he's going to do is just opening up all these problems, and he's not even going to have the, the ability to address it because he, well, because of time, and he's about to be done. The truth is in Jesus. Ephesians 4.21. And the psalmist says, and so do the New Testament authors, the truth is in Scripture. The entirety of... Okay, well, if the truth is in Scripture, then even if the church fails, people still have a source of the truth. They still have access to the truth. Your word, Psalm 119, verse 160. 
the entirety, the totality, the sum of your word is truth. Exactly. For Paul, the church is the sanctuary which God trusts with the fundamental moral category in the universe. Absolute truth. So this is what the church is all about. I've gone too long, haven't I? I'm done now. This is what the church is all about. Family. It's about family. It's about life. It's about truth. These are the rich resources that God has entrusted to every one of us in our churches. All right, so he, he, I, I, as someone who attended a Catholic university, I, I think he just may have hit a, a, you know, a home run for Catholic theology. Hey, if you want family, you need the church. If you want life, you need the church. If you want truth, you need the church. So the church is, in a sense, your mother. The church is the source of all of these things and almost implied that you can't, if, you know, that, where else are you going to find? Where else you, you can't find life because the culture is the culture of death. You can only find it in the church. I, families are all broken. So where are you going to find family in the church? And where are you going to find truth? There's no source other than the church. So you need the church. So the church is your mother. It is your, it is everything. It is, it, okay, well, that sounds very Roman Catholic. Now, how does that fit? How does what he just said fit into the Protestant mindset? Well, what, first of all, I don't, you know, I don't think, believe he, he even came close to proving that we should see the church as providing family. I don't, the church doesn't provide life unless now the church is in charge of salvation, No, life comes through salvation. It comes through the regenerating work of the sovereign work of God through the scriptures. Now, the church presents the scriptures, but, okay, so I, but people can access that truth of scripture and God can work outside of the church. Um, And then number three, if the church becomes the sanctuary and source of truth, then that means people must come to the church for truth, and then what the church declares to be true, they must submit to. Let me, about the pillar and support of the truth. Let me just, we're we're just going to stop there. We're not going to finish his summary there. But let me just pick, again, I got a commentary here. Let me just read what they, uh, how this commentary, they, they, instead of ground and pillar, this translation, the commentary is using, translates it pillar and support of the truth. Again, I think pillar and support I think really it's just two different ways of saying the same thing. The church holds up the truth. Everyone wants to draw a distinction between pillar and support. And I can understand why. I just think that, I just, I don't know if the two Greek terms really lead to a massive distinction. You can look them up yourselves. We talked about it in part one. But here we go. Here's how this commentary reads. The imagery of these terms, pillar and support of the truth, would not have been lost on the Ephesians. The impressive temple of the goddess Diana Um, or Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was located uh, in the city. William Barclay gives the following description of it. One of its features was its pillars. It contained 127 pillars, each one of them the gift of a king. All were made of marble, and some were studded with jewels and overlaid with gold. This comes to us from the letters to Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Uh, It was published in 1979, and that was taken from page 89. So this idea of pillar, they would have understood it because of the temple of the goddess Diana, or Artemis, and it contained 170 pillars. So they would have understood this. So each pillar acted as a tribute to the king who donated it. The honorary significance of the pillars, however, were secondary to the function of holding up the immense structure of the roof. So the the pillars were there in an honorary, decorative way to give honor to the king, okay? And it was to uphold the roof. Well, okay, if the pillar, if the church is the pillar, it's in a sense, it's there in an honorary decorative way to give honor to the king or to the source of truth. And then it holds up the truth of God's word. It's there, it's holding it up, right? There's the pillar function to lift it up, to hold it up, right? Now they go to the word support. Support appears, and they they call it the word, uh, they translate it the word support. Support appears only here in the New Testament and refers to the foundation on which a structure rests. Thus, in Paul's metaphor, the church is the foundation and pillar that holds up the truth. 
as the foundation and pillars of the Temple of Diana were a testimony to the error of pagan false religion, so the church is to be a testimony to God's truth. This is its mission in the world, its reason for existing. All right? Now, you can try to draw this... You can try to draw a distinction between pillar and ground, but it's it's the church is really there supporting and holding up the truth. Now, if if we if we say this the correct way, then the church's function is to take truth, which in other words, the church does not define, the church does not own, it's not in control of. It's here's the truth. Again, scripture, I pick it up and I hold it up and I lift it up and I support it and I speak it and I proclaim it and I defend it. But I, I don't control it. I don't own it. I don't, I don't define it. The scriptures define it. So there's the truth. So your allegiance would be to the scriptures, not to the church. And when the church deviates from the scripture, then you would, you would deviate from the church. That would be the Protestant understanding. But if you're not careful, you can take that passage and describe it in such a way that, no, you need the church. If you want truth, you need the church. You want life, you need the church. You want family, you need the church. Well, then that places the church almost in the place of the Roman Catholic Church where you must be submit to it because the church has control over it and you must turn to the church. It's, it's very careful. You're going to be very careful what you do here. And the way he just ended that almost turned the church into the way the Roman Catholic Church would say, as the mother who provides all of these things, and you can't go anywhere else to, to get it. But the average Protestant and practice doesn't believe that. We re- reject that every day. I mean, he was already calling out other churches for not doing it. So, so then that means a church can stop doing all of those things. Who gets to define, how do you determine when a church is and isn't doing it? It creates all kinds of problems, but we're going to have to stop right there because we've gone one hour and 21 minutes. Yes, one hour and 21 minutes. But I, I, I'm hoping that this, again, one hour and 21 minutes of working on First Timothy 3.15 has really brought the passage to your mind. I've placed a lot of things before you. You can do your work. You can do your thinking and you can... Uh, you can expand this conversation by emailing me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. All right, I'll stop right there. I'll be back on the air, hopefully here shortly. God bless.